So this bloke that we're about to chat to, Melissa, we go way back. He was four years old when I first met him, Toby Morrison. He started working up at, amongst other things, he wasn't really four, but it seems like it. It was so long ago. He started working uh, out of one of my centres in down here in Melbourne on the PN Highway, Brighton. He was a fledgling superstar. Now he's a fully qualified superstar. And we'll have a chat about what he does. But you probably already know because you read the... Uh, the synopsis of the show, everyone. But hi, Tobes. Hi, how are we? Mate, I'm really good. I'm really good. Where are you at? I know where you're at, but tell everyone where you're at. Where you're Because you were, you were down here from... Are you from, Vic, originally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grew up in Melbourne, Morty Alec. Yeah. And then made the lifestyle move to Sunshine Coast uh, six years ago, actually. I remember you banging on before online businesses were what they are now. I reckon 10 years ago, you were going, Harps, you've got to get this shit online. You've got to lift your game. And I remember you, because you were then, 10 years ago, you're 32 now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So 10 years ago, you were 22, obviously. And I remember me, because you had an office at my joint, and you sat me down and went, and it's like you gave me the big, big brother talk about how I needed to maximise my fucking my reach and my, my, you know, my impact and my brand and build my pro- – and here we are all these years later. And, and Melissa's been trying to drag me into the online space kicking and screaming for a good five or six years as well. So all I can say is uh, to both of you that COVID did what you two couldn't. Well, I just want to say how proud I am of you, mate. Like, you know, it's amazing how many people you're influencing now and I'm so stoked because I I got influenced by you, uh, I think it was 18 years ago when I actually first got um, sick with chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. And you were were one of my biggest um, sources of inspiration and I still remember now I had like, I had like a whole folder of Craig Harper articles, which had nothing to do with chronic fatigue, but everything to do with personal development and growth. And uh, I don't know if you remember this, but before I ever knew, so you were like, for me, I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. And that really helped me open my eyes to, well, what can I control and what can I do in my day-to-day life to help my current situation? And obviously, you know, four years later after being diagnosed and, and eventually getting better, I remember going to a cafe in Brighton and I remember I was a personal trainer at that stage um, and I walked past, what's that cafe that you always go to? Do you still go there? Um, uh, it used to be called The Spare Room. Yes, The Spare Room. Went to The Spare Room, walked past an old bald guy and another old bald guy, which was Johnny. And I, I remember thinking, shit, is that... Is that Craig Harper? Oh, steady on, steady on with the fucking old ball guy. <laughs> and I went to take a, I went to take a piss, and I remember just standing there at the urinal, going, "Do I say hi or do I not say hi?" And I don't know if you remember this, and I thought, "Fuck it, of course I'm going to say hi." So I walked past, and I was like, "Oh, excuse me, are you Craig Harper?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah." And I said, "I don't know if you remember me, but um, I called you when I was like 18. I called you, Jim, and I said, excuse me, is Craig Harper there?'" Um, and eventually eventually somehow i got your phone number and we spoke for two minutes and i said craig i want to be i want to be like you but just for people with chronic fatigue syndrome and and then i saw you at the spare room like four years later and i was doing it and i said i don't know if you remember i called you and i said i wanted to be like you you know and you said oh what are you doing now i said well i'm doing it i'm helping people with chronic fatigue syndrome da da da, da. and then we did that's how we connected and then you were like wow that's amazing and then you know yeah kind of just opened. well mate i'm <clears throat> You know, you know, I don't really piss in people's pockets, but you, you've done amazingly well. And, you know, you were always, you've always had, which is ironic because you had chronic fatigue, but, um, you know, you've always had great energy and you've always been good to be around. And you've always been, um, you know, you always had that fascination with human performance and behaviour and, the, you know, all the stuff that I talk about, which is, and even though your core kind of focus is on recovery from chronic fatigue and a few other things but you've always had that uh, innate understanding I guess of the importance of the psychology and the emotion and the physiology and the support and the process and you know all of the controlling our controllables you know as you said before and um, it's and you not only uh, did you recover but you know, you're helping people all around the world. I was having a squiz at your website before we went live and 
you know, I don't know where it's at now, but whoever did the copy on the website at that stage, it was you were working with and have worked with people in 48 countries around the world and thousands of people. Um, so, and, and not only are you, not only are you doing really good stuff, and this is what I always say to people, your, your purpose and your passion and your values don't need to live in isolation to building a business and brand. And if you can figure out how do I make money from this and also help people and meet needs and also live my values and be a good human, and as you've done, create a lifestyle and a space for yourself to be in where you just really like being in, in inverted commas, the middle of your life. And at 32, you've done what a lot of people can't do in their entire life. So well done to you. Give us a little bit of a snapshot before we get into just, I want to talk about the, the condition and um, the, the people that you work with. And I want people to get a bit more of an understanding of um, fibromyalgia and CFS and ME. I can't even remember. What, tell me what ME stands for. Myo something encephalitis. Myalgic encephalitis. Yeah. And they're the key people that you work with or they're the key conditions that you work with. But tell us about us. Tell us about your give us two or three minutes on your journey with um you personally chronic fatigue and uh how it impacted you how it impacted your life and your family and i guess even your direction and and your subsequent recovery yeah sure um so growing up i had so much energy you couldn't stop me um like you know I think my mum, when I was a kid, had like a, a coal, one of those coal leads that you kind of had your kid on because they just they were just too much energy. I know, but you were thirteen, then that was embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> still, want, still need one now. And basically, yeah, I was just like the life of the party. Just had so much energy, and I was quite tall as a as a teenager. And so basketball was my chosen sport. And so my dream was to become a famous basketball player. That was kind of this like vision that I had for myself. And I was kind of getting there, you know, I was working hard, I was training 14 times a week, um, you know, slam dunking the ball at 14, um, played a few VBL games at the age of 15, which was pretty decent for, for a kid. Amazing. And, and then basically I got glandular fever and, um, yeah, the, the carpet got swept underneath my feet basically and uh, I just thought it was a cold cold and flu and I was like well I'll, I'll push on and I'll be right in a couple of weeks and I kept playing sport and kept pushing myself and basically it was like a six-month journey of just like hammering my body into the ground and then eventually one day I woke up and I couldn't lift my head off the pillow like my, my system my nervous system just shut down um, but it was a progressive thing and basically you know we don't really get taught preventative stuff about health and at the time I was eating pretty shit not really shit really you know like cardboard box kind of cereal can of coke on the way to school a hot jam donut and you know was just very malnourished but at the same time training like a superstar athlete who who basically gets to rest all day but i wasn't resting you know it was just sport 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 work 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 very little sleep and very bad nutrition which was a great recipe for uh, chronic fatigue syndrome on the back of having a, a virus like glandular fever um and so for me it was uh, it was a long journey to get diagnosed. So I, I felt like I was dying. I remember vividly uh, the time when it, when it really got worse was I'd take off the whole week of school and then I'd just play my basketball game just to get through it. And then I'd take off another week of school and play basketball just to get through it. And it was my last game. And I remember just feeling totally off and I went to run to get the ball and I felt like I was running backwards, like my body was just shutting down. And then that was the next day when I woke up and couldn't lift my head off the pillow. And we went on a six month journey to try and find what was wrong with me, you know, hundreds of blood tests. Um, and, you know, even now it's still really hard to get diagnosed from your traditional doctor. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people just think you're making it up or it's all in your head or that you just need to sleep it off or, or think more positively. Um, but basically it's a neurological disease. Your body just kind of shuts down. Um, and for me, for me, I believe it's a multifaceted uh, syndrome so you know you can get it from a virus you can get it from pushing yourself it could be trauma it could be stress or it's usually a combination of, of those things where the body just cannot adapt anymore and uh, it's basically calling out for help um, you know screaming out listen to me listen to me 
and then, yeah, you know, for me, I went through a huge loss. It was like, who am I? You know, I was the tall, fit guy who'd, who'd run laps around anybody at school. And then all of a sudden I could barely walk. And, you know, I couldn't go to school. I lost 20 kilos of muscle weight. So I used to have a six pack and be totally ripped at the age of 15. And then I was just this skinny, scrawny kid who couldn't boast about his basketball ability. Um, Mm. And so for me, I kind of went, you know, I just grieved that life that I had. And also I didn't know that there was a potential possibility to get better because back then the internet was very negative with you know, there's no cure for chronic fatigue and there still isn't a cure in terms of there's no pill that you can take and you'll get better. And I think that's mm. the problem with chronic illnesses especially is that we kind of just think, well, there has to be, you know, we'll go to the doctor and we'll get the tablet and we'll get better. Just like, you know, a cold and a flu or an infection, we get antibiotics and we take it and we feel good. Chronic illness doesn't work like that. Mm. And uh, so, you know, it was a really tough journey for me to go through. But one of the things that was a pivotal changing point for me was kind of going through like 20 different specialists and, and hoping that they would cure me. And the last um, practitioner that I saw kind of said, like, he's like, all right, my boy, you, you're done. Uh, you know, you don't have chronic fatigue anymore. He did all this weird, wacky stuff. And you'd do anything to get better. You would literally <laughs> try to like this guy. He used to make me hum happy birthday and he'd tap me on the back and he'd make me drink all these random herbal potions and you'd be popping 40 Chinese medicine balls a day and you would just do anything. And what happened after that, I remember when he said I was better, I said, so what do I do now? I didn't feel much better. And he said, well, my boy, his name was Frederick Warwick. He passed away. I don't know if you know him. He, was, he actually worked at St Kilda Football Club back in mm. the And he's like, all right, my boy, you can go and run again. I hadn't ran for like three years. I was like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, I'll give it a go. I started running. And within five minutes, I basically collapsed on the side of the street. I was so deconditioned. I hadn't run for two and a half years, three years, yeah, yeah. and had a major setback. And what happened was, it was so perfect, though, because it was like, wow, no one can fix me. No one can fix me but me. And it was this shift. And it was like, Frederick Warwick, I couldn't rely on anyone, even Frederick, who, who was an amazing guy, but I was looking to him to fix me. And when I realized, actually, no, no one outside of me can fix me but me. And that's when I kind of came across your work, actually. I think I was like 17 at the time. And it was just so empowering because I was like, well, if it's, if it's to be, it's up to me. And, um, you know, it was hard, but I luckily got admitted to a hospital program, which was like a rehabilitation program for people with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And that taught me the importance of routine, sleep, nutrition and restorative movement and regaining strength and stamina in my body again. And that was the first time I had a glimpse of hope because I actually improved within four weeks. It was quite an intensive program, but I improved enough to go, wow, like I I can do this. And basically that set me on the path to know that I was going to get better and just do whatever it took to get better. And the pain and suffering that I went through in those first two years motivated me so much that I didn't want anyone else in the world to experience what I had to experience alone. And I wanted to be that shining light for other people that it was possible. So I never came into this work. I never thought it was a business. I didn't even think about money. I just wanted to help people. I wanted to make sure I remember I had 400 bucks at the age of 18. I was going to parties. And the only thing I could talk about was I just want to help people with chronic fatigue syndrome. I met a guy there who was a website designer and he said, that sounds awesome. He's like, I'll create your website. So I gave him 400 bucks created my website and it was just to share my story. Uh, And it wasn't until I became a personal trainer in the health and fitness kind of world. And I met you and, and a few other people and I started training the general population, but I knew I could do more. And it wasn't until I got my first chronic fatigue client um, where I helped him. He was a runner. He couldn't run for like two years and he was totally out and down and depressed. And we helped him get back on his feet within 12 weeks. He was running again. Uh, and then within six months he was competing and he just felt like he was back to normal. And for me, that was just, just gave me so much confidence that it wasn't just me that could get better, but it was other people. This stuff works. Doing the right things at the right time works. And then from him, then I saw another lady, uh, lady's daughter who, you know, she was quite well known in Melbourne in the hospitals and she, they tried everything. And that's the problem. We go everywhere outside of ourselves to try and get fixed, yet we're not doing what we can control in the 24 hours that we've got, which is actually going to give us the best results. 
Uh, obviously, there's, there's a timing thing, and you know, there's there's you know a place of where we need to do stuff and not do stuff, which I can break down later. But um, ultimately, for me, the biggest difference, and this is what I've seen in thousands of people that I've worked with, it was never a pill, it was never a person that got them better. It was what they did for themselves over a period of time that helped the most. Whether we talk about full recovery or or just general improvement in quality of life, any improvement is good improvement, especially when you've come from such a bad place. And so that's been my motivator for the last, you know, I remember when I was sick, I was dreaming about helping people because um, I just, you know, it was such an isolate. It still is. It's such an isolating illness for people. Like we, we have people in 48 countries and the most common thing people say to me is there's no help in my country. Even in America, even in England, even in the main countries, let alone little European countries, is like, my doc, you know, my doctor doesn't believe in it. And not, not, not all doctors uh, do say that, but the majority of them don't really get it. They don't understand it. Um, and it's quite, it's terrifying to be told, um, here's what's wrong with you, but there's nothing you can do about it. And, and for, you know, imagine being told that and you know nothing else. You, you, you don't, you, there's no positive stories. You can't see anything outside of this realm. Hey, here's what's wrong with you, but there's nothing we can do about it. It is gut-wrenching. And it sends you in a spiral of secondary dep- depression, secondary anxiety. Um, and basically, you know, of course you're going to be emotionally upset when you can't live the life that you wish to live. And typically, most people with chronic fatigue syndrome are not lazy people. These people are hardworking. They want to get the most out of themselves. They're type A personalities. And uh, the people that we work with are certainly that. It's so interesting. Wow. As you were talking, so many things came to mind. Melissa, as Tobes was talking then, did, did anyone come to mind for you that you and I know? Probably hasn't. But when I say that, does anyone come to mind that you and I know through the podcast? I'm trying to think. No, I don't think so. Dylan. Oh, yeah. Dil- yeah Dylan suffers from chronic... Well, oh, you didn't mention no. it. Yeah, Dylan. Dylan suffers from chronic fatigue yeah. and depression and anxiety. Mm. I know you've got nothing to do, Tobes, but have you... Su- I know you're just in your hammock up in your bloody mansion in Queensland, but do you reckon you could have a, ch- a brief chat to my boy, a 10-minute chat with my boy, Dylan? Sure, if he's interested. Yeah, yeah. Did you... Have you... Did you see the gorilla that... He drew yeah, on. he's an amazing artist. Yeah, that's him. That's him. And he's just the best dude. And he's just got a bunch of challenges and he's fucking, he's an awesome person. I'm, I'm with you. I love helping people. But I shouldn't have put you on the spot like that. But fuck it, I don't care, you know. Uh, um, no, but if you've got five or ten minutes and you can point him in the right direction, I might get you to have a chat to him or maybe he could get on board one of your programs or something. But that would be nice. When you... I was thinking a couple of things. One is how frustrating would it be when you know how sick you are and somebody's telling you, ah, it's not real. No. It's, all, it's all in you. There is no such thing as chronic fatigue. And you're like, fucking live in my body for 24 hours, champ, and then get back to me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me, um, I put up a thing on Instagram the other day and it just it pretty much just went off the chart. People just resonated with it so much and I described what, you know, what it's like to have chronic fatigue syndrome. This is what I wrote. How I explain chronic fatigue syndrome to someone that doesn't have it. Imagine going on a really long flight, drinking lots of alcohol, adding a cold and a flu on top of that, and you're in excruciating pain because you fell off some rocks and you hit your whole body all over. And then you wake up with jet lag, a hangover, and a flu, and in pain, times that by 20, and then imagine having that for a long time without drinking or going on a flight in the first place. Mm, Yeah. It must be the thing about like that. Obviously, there's the physical pain and discomfort and dysfunction. But then there's the fact that you kind of sadly or some people feel or some people do have to almost prove that it's real. Mm. I'm not full of shit. Like that's like an emotional and a psychological burden that nobody who's sick needs to have. It's funny you mention that, which not many people who haven't had it ever have ever said that. So it's amazing. I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised that you said that because you are who you are, but that's the biggest problem that I see. And sometimes like when people join our program, we have to teach them, stop it. You cannot change 
anybody else's opinion, your focus, you know, because a lot of people just feel like they need to prove their illness. Yeah. Which is a job within itself. But the problem with that job is it distracts you from what actually is going to help you improve. And so there's a path where you can go down this, it, it, it's who I am and look at me, I'm in so much pain. And that's, and we all go through it. There's that place where we just want to be uh, seen and heard. But how's that actually serving your recovery and taking you to the, the life that you want? And so there's a shift in focus that needs to happen in order to let that go, which is very hard when you want the approval of the people closest to you and also the ex- external world, because there's a lot of negative connotations. It's the yuppie flu. It's all in your head, like you said. And so letting go of that is a huge aspect of recovery in the first place because you imagine all the energy it takes when you're already depleted of energy to try and prove to someone that you're ill i was thinking the exact same thing i was thinking just as you said that i was going to say you're you're actually draining energy that you don't have on tap to try to get uh, you know recognition or acceptance or understanding from people that because you love them and they're like ah come on champ get up just go for a fucking jog it's all we all have a hard day Come on, mate. You be right. Yeah, come on. Get out of your head. Come on, push yourself. Sweat it out. And yeah. we need to harness the, the limited energy that we have. We've actually going to, which is, which, with what is going to give us the biggest return back to ourselves. And that's what we teach people, you know, and that's it, it, nothing magical. Like, that's the crazy thing. People recover and they improve and they get their lives back and they and people on the outside go, what, what is it? What did they do? Tell us the secret. And it's like, no, there actually isn't a secret, but it's all these little things that we actually don't think about that's important that actually does move the needle for people. And the, and the thing is, like many things, but I reckon with CFS more so than most, there is a really big spectrum, isn't there? Like, oh. it, it's like, well, that's it, it. people can, well... You know, for some people, it's a relatively short-term thing. I don't mean a week, but rel- and for other people, it's it's um, years, dec- yeah. it's ever, it's ever. You know, I think mm-hmm. Melissa was Dylan telling us about that dude that has basically been in bed uh, for decades, and yeah. he's fed by a drip, and he literally is incapacitated. I mean, you've got that dude at at the far end of the scale, and you know, that's one of the things I reckon is that there's no, you know, there's no absolutes. It's, there's very, it's, it's such a scale and it's such a range of, you know, duration and uh, limitation and physiological impact. Um, and also on top of that, you know, the recovery process is different for people, although there are similarities or the recovery time definitely is different. And there's no, like you said, you can't rock up to the old bloody CFS um, centre and they go, hang on, you're type 7, here's the type 7 pill, you'd be good on Tuesday. Doesn't happen. And that must bother people because, you know, everybody likes to, it's like you and I have had a version of this conversation and Melissa and I definitely have many times where whether or not it's, it's managing and overcoming CFS or whether or not it's, it's losing weight or whether or not it's managing your chaotic mind or whether or not it's building a business and brand or whatever the the goal is for the most part there is no best way but there's a best way for you and as you said when you because one of the challenges i reckon with what you do is that people do want a savior people do want someone to tell them what to do just tell me what to do and then you go well, a big part of, part of it is you figuring it out. They're like, oh, fuck, that isn't their appeal. And this if, is like we are programmed for this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, for, um, for me, one of the biggest, so we have a real, we have a pretty solid uh, application process to get into our program. Not, not anyone can get into it. Um, because one thing for sure is that coming from a place of desperation is never going to result in a good, good result. And but at the same time, we get messages and DMs every single day. Tell me what to do. You know, there's such such desperation because they're in such pain and they're struggling so much. But the first point of call is to calm calm your nervous system down, calm down, and let's logically look at how can we build a healthy foundation for you with where you're at. Some of our clients, like literally, we had one particular lady from America. She was in her 60s, and she would she literally looked like she was dying. Um, 
she had more illnesses that I, I didn't even know the name of half of them. And, and I, she said, do you think you can help me? I said, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure it's going to help you completely. However, working on your health on the fundamental level isn't going to be detrimental to you. Uh, it, it would be useful. And, and she said, what can I do? I can do nothing. And I said, well, can you listen? Can you hear me and listen to me right now? She said, yes, because we're on a webinar. And I said, are you sitting up or are you laying down? She said, I can sit up for like two minutes at a time. Uh, I said, what else can you do? She said, I can go to the bathroom once a day. I can shower once a week. And so we had to start there for her. You know, it, was, it, it wasn't about go for a walk or start exercising. Absolutely not. That was the last thing she needed. She needed to focus on what she could do right now. Within six months, her mum used to have to walk up and feed her every single uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Hadn't been downstairs in seven years apart from doctor's appointments. Within six months, she was eating her, all her meals downstairs with her mum. Within nine months, she was at the beach that she hadn't been to in 10 years, like with the sand between her feet and just feeling the wind on her face. And, and she was a different person. The colour came back, um, you know, and then a year later, she was just living her life again. She was, you know, driving seven hours to see her friends she hadn't seen for 20 years. And, and this is a person in her 60s who had been sick for over 10 years. Plus, she had a hell of, hell of a life. She lost her partner, her husband. Um, you know, she, she'd been through some shit. And so I've just seen it time and time again where you've just got to focus on where you're at. You can't, you know, exactly what you said. Everyone's different and we can get so overwhelmed at trying to find the answer, but the answer does start within, but also doing the fundamentals with where you're at is so important. And that's why there's such a stigma around exercise with chronic fatigue syndrome because it can be detrimental to exercise if you've got chronic fatigue. Just to go and start walking or running might be the last thing you need to be doing right now. You might need to be actually stopping all movement and exercise and start to restore and recalibrate your system before you start even think of, thinking about moving forwards with, you know, exertion um, because, you know, post-exertional malaise uh, is something that people with chronic fatigue syndrome need to be, you know, careful about. And so, again it's just doing the right things at the right time sometimes it's less sometimes it's more and uh it needs to be individualized uh, for the individual and i think you know that that principle of of really really um being in touch with your own physiology and paying attention you know there's like we talk a lot we speak a lot on the show about being present and being in the moment and being in tune with your body and oh, I say you know biofeedback which is your body's ability to tell you something like your body's always telling you something but many of us I'll say many of us for the most part have really disconnected from the wisdom that is our physiology because we do so much of life including food including all the other variables we do so much of it on autopilot that there's a lot of unconsciousness happening around things like sleep and restoration and food and movement functional movement healthy movement um and and therapy you know and but when you go hang on let me let me get in back in touch with my body let me get back in touch with my energy with my heart with my soul with my physiology with my cells with my nervous system with my respiration with my you know let me just pay attention to my breath let me just then all of a sudden like shit starts to happen. And, and this is because we've been so disconnected and we're so used to running from place to place for a solution, we actually underestimate our own ability to heal. And I think that's, you know, that, that idea that you spoke of, of, well, what can you do? I can sit up, cool, so sit up. And when you can't sit up, lie down. And when you feel all right again, sit up again. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, trained a, I trained a guy years ago who isn't, in light of one of our recent podcasts, isn't as impressive as Anna that we spoke with. Um, we spoke with a lady the other day, Tobes, who's lost 138 and a half kilos. I saw that, yeah, three people. And, fucking hell, three Kylie Minogue's, I said. It's fucking amazing. But anyway, I remember I had a young dude at the gym. His name was Ben. And um, he came to Harper's on Bluff Road. That was before, probably before we met. But anyway, 202 kilos and um, 19, 202 kilos and probably, anyway, all, all kinds of things going on, as you can imagine. And it was basically 
kind of dragged there by his parents <clears throat> as a last resort and he didn't really want to be there and so but anyway the, the the long the short version is that when I started with him he's like what's the point I can't do anything yeah and we, we'd literally get to the bottom of the stairs and I'd say you know from the bottom of the stairs to the entrance to the driveway is 40 meters let's walk there so we'd walk there and then we'd rest and he'd lean on something I go, that's good, mate. I go, let's walk to that driveway. Then we'd walk to the drive next driveway, which would be 50 metres, and he'd sit on the fence. Mm. And we'd talk about shit. I go, good, get up. He's like, oh, then we'd walk to another. And, and the, that block there was 900 metres, so it's not even one kilometre. It used to take him an hour to get the 900 metres. Mm. And eventually we ended up running the 900 metres like multiple times. You know, but that's the thing is you go, what can you do? Can you get out of that chair and sit back in it? Yep. So get out of it, sit back in it five times. That's training. And you know, all, because, I don't know, he didn't know what was possible. Like that was, the, and that's, this is what happens with, you know, I didn't know it was possible to, to be where I'm at today. Like there was no way, like. And so people come to us in that same kind of state of mind because they're basing their future off their current reality. And that's why mindset is such an important component of recovery. And that's why your work is so important because, you know, you can do all the right things. You could eat really healthy. You could, you could do some restorative movement. You could be calming your nervous system down. But if you're constantly beating yourself up and telling yourself that it's not possible for you and that you're different than everyone else, then, you know, you're more likely to go down the path that you don't want to go down. Mm. And it's until we switch that narrative and also start to see tangible improvements and results. Like we see it every single week in our program and it's phenomenal. Like, we had a mum, she's hilarious, but when she started, she was all over the place. She, she, she had two kids, really bad, could barely function during the day, couldn't look after her kids, husband had to look after the kids. And now within six months, she's, she's like, her, her husband works away now and she's like a single mum and, and, and he's doing it really well. Uh, and that's a huge improvement and a massive celebration for someone who couldn't look after their own kids six months ago to now cooking meals, to having the energy to play with them, to feeling excited about the future. You know, she's gone from living in a cage of fear and being so worried about tomorrow to now feeling like, what do I want to do? Like, what's what's my next dream thing? Like, what do I want to do with my business? How, how does that look? And so the, the conversation changes and what we spoke about six months ago isn't what we speak about now because her life is totally different. And so we have to, you, you know, when someone comes to us, we can't say like, well, what's your dream job? And what do you, how do you, how, what's your perfect life look like? It's like, we can't even go there yet. Let's just focus on where you're at. You know, what, what do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? And how can we just start today and start to do what's appropriate? One of the things that you mentioned about the physiology side of things and not pushing your body beyond its means is the first point of call for us is we teach all our members the baseline theory. Mm which is basically making sure that you feel no worse than you currently do after you do an activity. And so that activity might be grocery shopping, it might be cooking, it might be just, you know, for Michelle who did our program years ago, who, who lifting her head out of, the, out of the pillow, things like that. And once you get a solid foundation of your baseline, then you have you literally have a structure that you can plan your day around that's going to be appropriate for you and also build strength and stamina and resilience in your body that you can adapt to. But if, you, if you're constantly not in tune with your body, like you said before, and you're pushing and crashing and you're up and down and you're, you're not consistent, then it's very disheartening, one, because <laughs> mentally it's just, you know, it's up and down like a yo-yo. Two, you're not seeing any real progress. And three, you know, pushing and crashing is not good for your immune system. It throws you, it throws everything off basically. And so the stuff that we teach is very simple, but very hard to do on your own. And uh, once applied and you finally get it and you, and you know, our number one rule straight away is less is more, mm. less is more consistently. So if you can be more consistent with less intensity, we'd rather that than you doing something once a week and being exhausted for the rest of the week. Mm. Um, and it's crazy how much better people feel. Their symptoms decrease 
pretty much within the first week once they do it right and they figure out their baseline. Sometimes it takes people two months to figure it out because they they have no clue. They're like, oh, shit, I didn't even know. I didn't realise I was pushing so much. Um, you know, something that springs to mind, sorry, is that, and I've said this many times too, but it's really relevant for this. So you've been working with people um, for 14 years with CFS and had it for four years yourself before that and talked to, you know, you and your team. By the way, I had a look at your website and I had a look at your team. I think you are somewhat discriminatory <laughs> uh, because there's no fucking chance I'm getting a job for CFS Health. Oh, it's funny. Hang on. No, don't even start. Don't even start defending yourself. If you want to see... Uh, I'll you. If you want to see, if you want to, no, 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 no. You want to see discrimination in action? Go to uh, Toby's website. It's uh, cfshealth.com and just have a look at his team. It's fair to say that fifty-six-year-old ugly blokes aren't getting a gig anytime soon. There. We we, so, we have strong uh, empowered women on our team, and I was going to invite you as a guest speaker actually for our members because they'd be so excited to meet you. So, <laughs> the invitation is there if you want to take back what you just said. <laughs> Oh, fucking hell. If I get my head next to all those hot ladies that you've employed, I'll be very surprised. Oh, God. You, I don't know if you're allowed to say, are you allowed to call women attractive? Is that, that to me seems like a compliment, but these days I'm not sure. No, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure someone will think I'm a pig because noticing the fact that, that somebody, it's like you're an attractive man, but I'm allowed to say that. But anyway, no, good on you, mate. It's, it, you're killing it. But what I was going to say was, that what they don't tell us is, or, or what maybe people don't think about so much is, and yes, I'd love to talk to, you, to your crew, but what people don't think so much about is that whether or not it's you who has conversations every day with thousands of people over 14 years and you and your team are at the coalface of this um, condition and I've had literally tens, maybe more, tens of thousands of conversations and worked with tens of thousands of bodies and written I don't know how many fucking programs, we're all still taking an educated guess, you know, because there's no absolute. What we're doing is you're taking all of your knowledge and experience and observations and outcomes and then to the best of your ability, you're talking to Craig when he rocks up and I go, mate, I'm fucked and I've got no energy and you go, all right, well, let's try this and let's try that because there's no certainty of outcome or no predictable certainty of absolute outcome with any particular stimulus so we know that of course there's going to be an impact from nutrition and sleep and movement and stress management and all of those things but in terms of tweaking it and the variables and the dose and the outcome you know even and this is what people think sometimes you're being disrespectful when you go the gp that you see he or she is guessing it doesn't mean they're not knowledgeable or clever but they're still guessing because they've never treated your body with your condition. They've treated other bodies with similar conditions. So what everyone does is their absolute, and that's all we can do is that's not a criticism because it's the same. It's the same with me. Anyone that comes to me that I've never had an interaction with, all I'm doing is bringing all of my knowledge and experience to that moment in time. And based on that and my understanding, I'm doing my best. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so true. Like what one person needs is it could be the total opposite of the other person. Like we had a lady, a sweet lady. She joined, I think it was like seven, eight months ago. She joined up and within the first month she was freaking out, like just like, Oh my God, like I don't know what to do. Like there's, oh, there's so many different videos and like which coaching sessions should I come to? And, and, I, and you know, I've invested this money and, and it's like, Nicola, you invested this money to actually stop doing this. And I called her on it in the group. We do group calls every single week. And it, and it was, you know, everyone's so willing to show up. And I said, this is, you need to do the opposite. Like, I want you to pick one or two videos per week max. That's it. Stop over, overwhelming yourself. And I said, you've invested this in yourself to actually slow down and pick what you need, not what you think you want with everything. And she she's a different person. Like, literally within eight months, she's a different human being. Her language her energy, her posture, like 
it's a different person. I, when we speak, like we joke about, I'm like, I don't even, you're, you're a total, she's almost 50 and she's like, I can't wait for the next 50 years of my life. Like she's genuinely excited about the next 50 years. Whereas when she joined, she was just a, a total overwhelmed mess. Um, and it's just, it's just incredible to see, but she didn't need more. She needed less to start with. And you know, it's interesting that the language, like I'm really interested in, people's language the other day we had um and our stories as i said we had anna on who by the way was lovely and kyle and one of anna's story stories was um oh, i wanted to lose the weight to prove everyone wrong yeah. um, and i'm like well firstly didn't you tell me that your friends bought you the sessions and that you had a personal cheer squad and they were the ones that got you there they encouraged you and supported you and Kyle, your trainer, is fucking amazing and everybody at Vision is happy for you. And I'm like, who are these people, who are these horrible people that you need to prove wrong? Like, it's funny the stories that we tell ourselves. And one of the stories is also like, oh, there's so many videos, Toby. It, that, it really stresses me. And then you go, hang on, hang on. Well, there's 10 other people in the group or 50 or 1,000 other people and they've all got access to all the same videos but you're the only one who's, so is it about the videos or is it about you? Is this about your story? Like, where is the stress coming from? Is the stress coming from the videos as per your comment or is the stress something that you're creating? Is it a personal reaction? And again, this is not, you know, one of the things that pisses me off a tiny bit, I've got to be honest, is when you're saying things like this, people are, Oh, that's harsh. No, it's not fucking harsh. It's true. Like, this is just true. We create our own stress by telling ourselves stories. And one of the stories is, oh, this is so hard. This is, oh, there's too many options. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck, and now I'm stressed. And guess who created it? You, you fuckwit. You know, <laughs> you. And that doesn't mean you're bad or flawed, but you have to realise what you're doing. And by the way, have I made myself stressed? Of course. Do I do it? Of course I do. Just come back, to, to, come back tonight at 11 o'clock when I'm trying to figure out my fucking lit review. <laughs> and, and I think it's all about the lit review, but it's about my ineptitude, you know. But this is one of the things that we've got to do is I reckon with everything, especially when it comes to healing and recovery and improvement across all paradigms is to go, okay, what's my story here? And is my story serving me or sabotaging me? Yeah, yeah. We have um, we have a resident mindset coach in our program. So basically, mm. we, we hold coaching sessions every single week. We've got a functional doctor, um, obviously health coaching. We've got a mindset coach. And so, you know, with chronic fatigue syndrome, you need a holistic approach. You can, it's not just your mindset. It's not just, you know, you work on your physical, but you're still blocked mentally, you know, or you work on your me mental stuff, but physically you're not progressing. So we need to have a holistic approach. But... With our mindset coach, like it's fascinating exactly what you said about that lady that you podcasted with last week or so. She had such an away from motivation. I want to lose weight to prove them wrong. It wasn't a, it wasn't a positively enforced uh, narrative. Maybe it's changed now, probably has, sounds like it. But one of the things we teach our guys in our program, we have a, a whole values program component, basically shifting them from an away from motivation. I want to get healthy so I can stop being sick. But they're still focusing on being sick. I, uh, you know, it's like, I want to uh, I want to lose weight so I can stop being fat. You went through it yourself. You've spoken about this a million times. And it's so powerful, the story that we tell ourselves, because if we're still focusing on what we don't want, we're still going down the path that we don't want, even though we don't realise it. So even we had a client on a call the other day. I said, what's your goal? What's your intention for the month? Which, which is we set up every single month. And... She said, I want to stop being in pain. I'm spending so much money on, in, on chiropractors. And I said, no, 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 stop there. I said, I asked, what do you want? And she, didn't even, she wasn't even aware of it. And in front of the group, I said, now tell me what you do want. And, she, and I said, what's the opposite of being in pain for you? And she said, well, I want to feel healthy, vibrant, and more stable. And the whole room felt the shift energetically just from the words that she said. And I said, now with, with what you said, what are you going to do in the next month that will help you feel that way? And so, you know, she wrote a list of things down that was going to help her do that tangibly, uh, you know, to follow through with the actions that she wants. But 
until we get clear on what we want, then the action items that we're actually going to do isn't going to be that useful. And that's why mindset is so important. It's not about positive thinking. It's not like think yourself better. It's actually, mm. it's more the behaviours that uh, are going to create the change from the mindset thinking that you're having, you know. So mm. I don't want pain. Oh, I'm going to focus more on trying to not have pain versus I want to feel vibrant, healthy and stable, which means that I should probably meditate every morning. I should probably eat five good, healthy, balanced meals to balance out my blood sugar levels. I'm going to rest three times a day. I'm going to schedule in some fun activities for me every single day. I'm going to go to bed at nine o'clock every night because I know that works for me, whatever it is. And yeah, the shift is instant, really. Like it's phenomenal to watch those shifts in the moment of these calls. So I just want to, can you just, we've probably got 10 or 15 minutes if that's all right with you, mate. If you could just give us, um, so I'm reading off, off your um, site here, CFS Health has recognised Australia's first health centre solely dedicated to helping people with ME, uh, CFS and fibromyalgia. Give us a snapshot. So we've been speaking about chronic fatigue, which is, they're all interrelated. I kind of get that. Give us a snapshot of ME and fibromyalgia and how they kind of interact, if that's the right word, with CFS. Yeah, so the problem with these labels are they're basically just a, a name to describe a bunch of feelings that the person's experiencing. And so ME was kind of um, used to make chronic fatigue syndrome, I guess, a more powerful statement to the, to the public and the world because chronic fatigue, everyone's like, oh, I'm tired, you know, and it kind of di disregards how, how bad it actually is to experience chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so that's kind of that fibromyalgia is basically chronic pain. So not acute pain where you roll your ankle or you t tear your bicep off your bone from weightlifting chronic pain, the, the pain that lingers for a long period of time. And same thing with chronic fatigue syndrome, it's a chronic condition. So it's, it's a, it's a six month plus condition. It's not like, Oh, I feel tired for two weeks and, and now I'm fine. It's like, no, it's, it, you know, your symptoms have to persist for more than six months to, be diagnosed with, uh, you know, with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is much more a chronic pain, you know, wide, widespread pain uh, sensation in your body for a long period of time. Kind of unexplained, you know, like it's an unexplained pain, basically. I'm, I'm not sure, um, obviously, which is why I'm asking the question, but um, it seems to me there's a fair bit of inf cellular inflammation with um, fibromyalgia. Um, Yes, 100%. it's quite it's quite inflammatory uh, so i'm guessing a and also we know that sugar causes inflammation and i'm not an advocate for bloody keto or paleo or anything i'm just a a mm. curious mind uh, is there any evidence to say that like a really low sugar low starch uh low refined carb diet has some positive relationship with um fibromyalgia for sure uh We've got to look at the factors that are causing inflammation. Stress is the first one. Oh, know? yeah. Yeah. Um, if your nervous system is just on fire all the time, your body's not regulating and spending all its time trying to, trying to just be in flight and fight. So calming the nervous system down usually is the first point of call. Uh, nutrition is just mind-blowingly ha helpful. But the funny thing is even with nutrition, we complicate it and we, we just put all our eggs on the one basket and we think we just need, once we get this diet, it's going to fix our problems, yet we're still not having a multifaceted approach. And the stress of the diet in itself is actually making it worse than the benefits that the diet would give you in the first place. And so one of the things that we teach our clients is the non-diet, basically making sure that we're having whole foods, you know, uh, balanced protein and low carbohydrate diet uh sorry low gi carbohydrates not not no carbohydrates to balance your blood sugar levels to give you the energy to keep going your body needs as much fuel as possible to help your body heal and if you're so many people under eat because they're so worried about putting on weight yet their body needs so much nutrition to help them heal and, you know, we had a client, literally, we, we, he went through the nutrition modules and he said he just noticed a difference within the first few days. He was like, wow, like, I just didn't realise 
that not eating regularly and that skipping meals and you know not having well balanced meals with with my protein uh, carbohydrates and fats was making me feel the way I was feeling with brain fog and concentration and just overall stability. So, you know, it's big, but one of the other things that we see with type A personalities is that they kind of just have this tunnel vision of like, this is it. I'm going to, I'm all or nothing. I'm all in. And they go keto. They do the, you know, the latest detox. And then they feel like shit within two weeks because their body actually doesn't need that. That just needs to be supported. Um, it's almost counterintuitive for a type A because they're like, fuck you. I'm going to recover from CFS quicker than anyone ever. <laughs> like you can get fucked. I'm going to show you how fucking amazing I am. And CFS is like, nah. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's like, that's why mindset is so important. Like learning, embedding to tune into your body and listen to it is such an art. It's an art. It's a dance. You know, like this is what we teach. It's not like this linear approach where you know, you get it, you embed it, and you're good to go. It's really coming back into yourself and then learning and feeling that versus, like you said, having that FU mentality of, like, come on, like, just get on with it. Um, you know, we need to restore first before we start to kind of uh, exert energy. You know, Paul Check, you've had him on the podcast too. He talks about working in and working out. And so that's a big philosophy that we've embedded in our program is having working in restorative rejuvenative activities for yourself that is going to give you energy versus expelling energy and um, typically 90 percent of the people that we work with need that first they're so used to pushing themselves and having these pushing and crashing episodes that they need to kind of level out and build a baseline that's going to give them the foundation to build their dream house on and then go and do what they want to do and so there's this integration phase through recovery that Yes, once they get the house, then, you know, like I said, the clients that w- who've been with us for six to eight months are now starting to look out the window and go, oh, I can't wait to create the life that I want. And then they yeah. start to think about their career, business, marriage, partnership, whatever it is. And you know what's funny is, um, did Toby's audio go weird for about 60 seconds then? It did go a little bit weird. Sorry about that, guys. That's all right. So sorry, everyone, but you're back now, normal types. But what's... Okay. Um, What's interesting is that, yeah, for that personality type, the shit that, that they, the stuff that they need to do is almost counterintuitive, right? Because they're so hardwired for optimal effort and energy and output and return. And, and also, you know, that's, the, that's a message that in society right now, hustle and grind and succeed at all costs and, you know, improvise, adapt, overcome. And that's kind of, you know, and, and that's very reinforced. And when someone says, no, chill out and be still and go slower and pay more attention and hustle less and, and you know. Um, I wanted to ask you to, there's a book that I've spoken about a couple of times that I reckon you would like. It's called Drunk Tank Pink and I reckon it's a good book for people with CFS and it's written by a dude called Adam Alter and it's about the way that our environment affects everything from healing and health and recovery to our nervous system, to our breathing, to our thinking, to our outcomes, to our life experience. And so like, for example, you live, you know, you moved out of Melbourne and you're living in a beautiful place up in Queensland near the water, blah, blah, blah. Just the fact that you live in a really nice environment has a positive impact on your health without trying, you know what I mean? And so Adam Alter talks about the way that, everything from the people that we hang out with to the colour of the paint on our walls to whether or not we are anywhere near nature to the clothes that we wear to the culture or the environment of the workplace that we are in to whether or not we have a dog in the house. If you have a fucking dog in the house and you love dogs, your nervous system is going to be better than if you're a dog lover without a dog. Conversely, if you fucking hate dogs, it's going to be worse, right? So there are all of these kind of physical variables that we can manipulate to create an environment, a physical environment to work or live or play in that actually is healing us without us doing any uh, conscious work. Like I know, for example, like I've got this studio that you can see now. When I'm in this studio, I feel in podcast mode. I feel 
Like this is, this is where I come to do podcasts. If you're and it's like, yeah. And I don't need to go, fuck, get into podcasts, but I just walk into this room and I'm good. I walk upstairs to my office where I do my study and my work. I walk into that room and it's like my brain goes, okay, we're researching now. Or, okay, we're writing whatever now we're doing this. Or, you know, then I walk into the bedroom and my brain goes, fucking giddy up, Netflix. All right. You know, so, so yeah. it's like I've trained my body to, to just respond to the environment without me having to try and will it there. And I think that, you know, for people who are really, and not just with CFS, but with everything, if you want to improve your, uh, your immune system, if you want to calm, if you want to switch off the, the sympathetic, the fight or flight and turn on the parasympathetic, the cool and the calm, you know, where you are and how you are and everything down to the clothes that you wear has an impact on how you feel. Well, yeah, you make a great point. One of the things that we teach our clients, especially if they're bed bound or house bound currently, uh, just getting out of your pajamas in the morning and putting on normal daily clothes is actually a huge game changer for them to for their brain to register. Okay, I'm out. I'm it's I'm out of sleep mode, and they might go from the bed just to the couch if that's where they're at, and that's better than staying in bed all day and associating being awake but laying in your bed mm. and so, you know that's a huge one like funnily enough and i should have mentioned this to start chronic fatigue syndrome usually there's stages yes you might be fatigued and you might sleep 14 to 16 hours a day at one stage of your recovery but usually what happens is sleep irritability at some stage too where you're tired all the time but you actually can't sleep it's like insomnia um, and that's a major problem that we help our members break down to go, let's have a good routine and structure that suits you. You might need to sleep during the day in a window, but let's not sleep too late during the day because that's going to affect your nighttime sleep too. And light, seeing the sun in the morning, watching the sun go down, dimming your lights, that's all environment too. Getting out of the PJs in the morning into a T-shirt and shorts is letting your brain know that, okay, I'm awake now, I can go and have breakfast. And sometimes even breakfast alone is waking up your system to say, okay, it's time to start your day. You mm. know, it's fascinating. And you're right, the colours, even the colours. I wear this, you're seeing, I'm wearing this white shirt. This is my work shirt. Mm. Um, I wear this when I'm in front of camera because it's the same thing as you feel in your podcast when I'm in front of camera wearing this white shirt, I'm on. It's, it's just... It's professional for me. Whereas if I was, you know, Sunshine Coast, it's hot. If I had my top off, I'd be just very relaxed and not on my, uh, on my game. <clears throat> now, mate, before we go, the most important question, how's that puppy of yours? Come here, Ziggy. I'll show you. She's huge. Oh. Come. She's literally walking. She heard you. Come here. She's about. Oh, well, Melissa's. About. Can you wow. see her? Oh, that is. Hang on. Hi, now, let Ziggy. Me try. Oh God! <laughs> yeah. where, where did you get Ziggy? Well, my friend wanted a puppy, and he said, "Can you come and check out these puppies with me?" And I said, "Yeah, okay." And I said, "What breed?" He said, "Bull Arab Bull Mastiff." I said, "That sounds like the ugliest dog in the world." And so I was like, "Oh, I'll come with you." And um, I went, and Ziggy was sitting there with eight other crazy puppies. They were all biting our feet, apart from Ziggy. She was sitting there behind. You see how docile she was just then when she was hugging me. Mm. Mm. And she was sitting there and I was like, oh, my God. And I picked her up and within 20 minutes I was like, I've got to take her. And my mate's like, you can't even look after yourself, let alone the dog. And uh, the lady said, look, why don't you sleep on her and I'll hold her for one more day if you want her. And I went home that night. The lady called her Zigzag because of her stripes. And um, I went home that night. I never read in bed. I opened up a book and the first word in the paragraph was Zigzag. And I was like, shit. I literally was like, holy fuck. And so I messaged the lady. I said, I'll be there tomorrow at six o'clock to pick up Ziggy. And that was it. And then I didn't realise at the time, but I probably should have had a backyard in my home, which I didn't have in my townhouse that I own. And so I had to move out of there and rent another place with a backyard just so she could have some roaming room. So it's pretty <laughs> funny you do for a dog but yeah so you're not so so you're not living in your own place you're renting no, somewhere no, just renting, for the i'm renting a house for my dog <laughs> so but you know what melissa was loving you but now she really loves you uh, yes 
<laughs> that's awesome. That's yeah, so cool. That's, that's just who I am. I'm a spontaneous, but you know, like I would never plan, you know, I just, it was just one of those things. I just, I had to have her in my life. So it's just like, well, let's just do it. And after six months of being in the townhouse and taking her out for a wee every two hours and speaking to Bob and Jane, because I lived on the main street of the beach in Coolum, I was just like, I'm never getting anywhere with my work or anything. I'm just sick of seeing everyone every single second. So I yeah, I got a nice house out the back somewhere with a bit more privacy and room to roam for her. Well, good for you, mate. Now tell us uh, if people want to find you or they want to learn a little bit more about um, the programs or they just want to yeah. learn a bit more about CFS in general, what's the best thing? Yeah, we have some brilliant free resources that I'd really recommend everyone to check out first. Um, which they can go to cfshealth.com and you'll see the free trainings. And so there's a training on how to find your baseline. There's a free one hour webinar on the three key mistakes that you can make for your recovery and how to reverse that. And there's also some case study guides where you can download and read some really inspirational um, stories of other people of all ages and um, sexes who have improved their life. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about the program, there is a whole information um, panel and, you know, the thing that I want to say to anyone who is suffering out there is, uh, you know, just it's kind of what Harp said is like surround yourself with people who lift you up and you can't underestimate that. And that's one of the powerful things about our program is the community, the like minded people who are all moving towards what they want versus what they don't want. And it has a ripple effect without you even realizing the importance of it. And usually after people finish our program, I say, what was the most valuable thing? They say the community, uh, even though that was a secondary thing from the program, um, they realized how much inspiration and growth that gave them throughout their process. Um, awesome. Awesome. Well, mate, we appreciate you and I'm super proud of you. And, um, I'm not going to ask you about your relationship status cause I've been warned. So fuck that. I'm not even going to ask. Uh, sorry, Melissa, I had to go there. No, that's all right. Just work through a few things. <laughs> I, appreciate, I appreciate you uh, holding that boundary. <laughs> um, all right, mate. Toby Morrison, thank you so much, man, for being on the, uh, the U Project. And uh, we will uh, hopefully we'll get you again because I reckon we might have, we could probably squeeze in a, a Q&A episode down the track, Melissa, do you think? I think so. If Toby's up for it, I think there will be quite a few questions coming through. Well, I think as well we should do a reverse podcast where we talk about harps going broader. There's so many people who want to be with you, not sexually, but just like <laughs> maybe <laughs> sexually. Well, actually, maybe I don't know. I don't, I don't yeah. read. I don't read your inbox messages, but well, there's that one dude in Broad Meadows who keeps emailing <laughs> me. But other than him. But I, I'm really keen to see you keep expanding and helping more people because your work is so powerful and uh, I'm really excited for where you're going too. Thanks, mate. We appreciate it. Melissa, thank you. Thank you. Stay on the line, Tobes. Thanks, everyone. Love your guts. See you next time.